and it was just a really, really powerful picture. And I realized with this picture that I had no clue what was going on with the rest of the world. I had a basic idea of what a refugee was, but nothing else. It touched my heart and I knew it was something that I needed to care about. I saw the picture, I cried, I learned about it, I studied. The next day we went to Livingstone, we told all the kids about it and they were like, what is this going on? And like they didn't know and we got together and we prayed for these children, for these families, for the, these countries. Then I posted something on Facebook after all of this and I was absolutely, completely shocked. Christian friends on, on Facebook were posting against what I was saying. Um, basically like, no, we, we don't need to be worried about this issue. This is not an important issue. We need to be worried about people who are here. We need to be worried about other things. We need to not have let them come in because they're terrorists and other things like this where I was absolutely broadsided and involved in a very long three or four page <laughs> comments on Facebook. And anyways, through that whole long conversation and a lot of interesting learnings about like what was going on in the U.S. while I was in Brazil, I met Em through a mutual friend and um, uh, she basically helped moderate some of the people who are commenting with false statements about refugees and a lot of that was just because she had hands-on experience working with Exodus Refugee right located right here in Indianapolis. So what led you to work at Exodus? Yeah, so I in college I studied Spanish and I studied TESOL which is teaching English to speakers of other languages. So I was teaching adult English as a second language. For many of my students it's actually like the third or fourth even seventh language for some of them. Um, but all of my students in my first classroom right out of college, they were all from Burma. And at the time, I didn't even know Burma was a country. So I learned a lot from my students, and I just learned through that relationship that I had with them that all of them were refugees. I started to learn more about refugees, and then I got involved um, at Exodus Refugee, where I taught English as well. Um, since we were a smaller agency, we all kind of helped and did different things. So I would go to the airport and pick up new families, and um, us as an agency, we would provide services, like I said, in the first 90 days, and that included providing housing for people, um, providing trainings, so financial trainings, trainings about the workplace, um, trainings for English, and also getting people connected to their schools, enrolling children in schools, um, doing just a lot of different things like that. Can you quickly describe exactly what a refugee is, or what does it mean to be a refugee? Being a refugee is a very specific migratory status, and um, people kind of use that term lightly, but it really means very specific things according to the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. The first thing is that they have to be outside of their country of origin. So um, when we talk about the situation that's happening in Syria right now, there are many people that are displaced within their own country um, that are still in Syria but have had to move to a different city, and we would call those internally displaced persons, and so they would not actually be considered a refugee because they're still in Syria. So the people that have left Syria and gone to another country, um, they would be a refugee. They are outside of their country of nationality, and that they would have to fall under one of five categories. Um, they have to prove a, a well-founded fear of persecution for their race, their religion, their nationality, or their membership in a particular social group or um, political persuasion. So a refugee who goes from from their home country to a secondary country would register with the United Nations and they would have interviews and have to prove that they would qualify for one of those five categories for persecution for one of those reasons. There's a lot of different agencies that are involved in that and determining eligibility for refugee status and then ultimately whenever people um, apply for resettlement which is when they go to a third country through a different process. Okay, that's a third process afterwards. Yeah. Okay, and in the link below, um, I'll put a really awesome video that describes the actual process. What are some stories that have really connected with your, your heart in working at Exodus? Wow, there are so many stories. I mean, just every person I've talked to is coming from a different place and has a lot um, that they carry with them. And a lot of times I don't get to know people's stories just because there's a language barrier, so I just know very little um, about them. But there are times when I can have a conversation with someone or with an interpreter, I get a glimpse into their story and their background, and some people don't want to talk about it because it's really traumatic. Um, a lot of what people go through is things that they don't want to bring up anymore because that's in their, their life before. But I would say one, one student that I had in particular just kind of gave me a glimpse into his world, and he was from Myanmar as well, Burma, 
and um, the first time that we kind of connected was I gave my students a prompt and it was just a writing prompt to, to write about their home country and um, I just opened that up so that people who did want to talk about the trauma that it, they experienced there could have the opportunity to share it but then other people just shared about like oh this is what you know the country looks like these are the different states and everything so this student in particular wrote about um, a massacre that he had witnessed and it was very detailed it was broken English but through that he got to share some of his story started drawing pictures and that became a way for us to like connect and for him to continue to share his story through, through art. And well, last year we were actually able to come share at um, one of his English classes and it was absolutely incredible. Like she said, just putting faces like when you just hear on the news refugee, you know, you, you don't know what to do with that word, but when you know individual people, it's like, you know, that's that's Joy, that's Anne, that's Steve, that's Paul, you know, that's that's what who it is. What is your heart about refugees that you would like to share? Well, I think you kind of just hit on that a little bit earlier, just saying that, you know, we hear that word refugee and we have a specific idea in our mind of what a refugee is, or we think about refugees in terms of numbers or concepts, but um, really when we look at it as a human issue, it, it changes things. And from a Christian perspective, specifically, I would just say, um, you know, in, in Psalm 46, it says that, that God is our refuge and that he's our strength and that he's a present help in time of need. And when I, that's true. Um, I can see that looking in my life, how God has been my refuge and, and my strength in times where I've been hopeless or I have just felt like the world is crashing in on me. I turn to God and he provides that, that present help. Like he is present, he's with me, um, but his presence is, is a, a redemptive presence. It's a helpful presence. It's not just I'm here, it's I'm here and we're walking through this together. And I think that because God has shown us that sort of love and that, that presence and that help, that we are called to do that to others and to not just turn a blind eye and pretend like things are happening. Um, and I know it's a really sensitive issue when we talk about um, safety and protection and, and fear. That's the big word that I hear all the time and that I sense from people is fear. And I would just have two things to say about that. I think the first thing is that um, we need to make sure that our field of fear is well-founded, that it's not um, based off of misinformation. That's one thing. And the second thing, too, is that, you know, God, ultimately, if you are believing, if you are a believer and you are following Christ with your life and you've surrendered your life to Christ, um, like God has never called us to put our, our safety and our protection above loving other people. And I know that's a really hard thing to swallow and to process, and um, it doesn't negate anyone's fears or feelings of um, confusion, but it's just the reality that God has called us to something higher, and, and in that we find a lot of opening ourselves up and welcoming people even though you know it might feel like a risk or it might feel like uncomfortable to us. Whenever the election happened within a week there was an executive order on immigration that directly influenced the refugee resettlement program so that affected us in a major way and forced us to make changes that um, that resulted in a third of our staff being cut and um, I was one of those that had that I lost my job so um, we all had kind of anticipated those changes and kind of you know, we're expecting them, but it was still hard going through that. And um, I found out on a Wednesday, a Wednesday afternoon, that I was being cut, and Friday was my last day. So I had two days to process everything and to say goodbye to people, and um, it was really difficult. Transitions in life are really difficult, but yeah. when it's something you feel really passionately about, you feel like you're in the right place and you're able to do something practical to help people, then um, you feel, you know, just a purpose there. So that was really hard to let that go, but. I think um, if you asked me or anyone else that has lost their job at Exodus, they would tell you that um, losing our jobs was the least of our worries during that time, just because there were a lot of changes that were on a, on a national level, affecting people, international level, affecting a lot of people, and we had clients that we've been working with who are waiting for family members who were overseas that now they thought they're never going to come, you know, husbands that are separated from wives. And, mothers that are separated from children, you know, like family members that are apart, and now they're thinking, okay, this person can never come and be here. There's a lot of anxiety, a lot of fear, and, and for the people who were here, they were just feeling like, we're not welcome anymore, and are we able to stay? Like, are we going to have to go through another really traumatic transition? So, 
it was kind of the least of my worries about my job, but it was mostly like, okay, how can we really just step up and show that refugees really are welcome here during this time. I'm still working with refugees and working with immigrants and refugees, and um, I'm working in a legal capacity now. So I'm not a lawyer, but I'm working at a legal clinic that provides um, legal education and representation to low-income families. Um, and it's a Christian agency, so we're doing this um, just as a way to show God's love. Thank you so much for sharing hey, You're welcome. Us. That's great. Thank you. Dun-dun-dun-dun-dun-dun, Kate and Rachel show with Amber Gerber. Gerber, Gerber, Gerber. <laughs>